Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to be making uh, an interesting video on a recent book that I read. So I recently pick picked up this book, Mergers and Acquisitions, Turmoil in Top Management Teams by Jeffrey Krug. And it's a short book, I think it's like 120 pages, so it's about a day's read. But it's really interesting because uh, Jeffrey Krug, he has collected a database of over 22,000 executives and their experiences across, you know, the corporate management space and wh how they moved and the reasons why they moved, et cetera, et cetera. And so he published this book really on his research talking about how through M&A, why is there such a high turnover rate following an acquisition in the target company? And it's an important question to ask and also understand why the reasons for leaving come about. Is it the fault of the acquirer or is it something that's inevitable? And at the same time, a very important question, and is that good for the acquirer? If you are buying a company, are you buying just the company or are you buying the expertise of management? Because if you're buying the management expertise and a lot of them leave in the first three to four years, well, all of a sudden, what's the point of making that acquisition in the first place? So there are a lot of valuable questions that can be answered, and I'm going to try to answer them in this video. So let's get started. So a firm's top management team is composed of its top executives, those responsible for formulating and executing strategies for achieving the firm's long-term goals and creating a sustainable competitive advantage. Among their many responsibilities, they determine the firm's mission, establish corporate culture, set short and long-term goals, and oversee strategy and long-term vision. And right away, I remember when I was reading this book, I was thinking about all these like responsibilities and I'm thinking ah that's not they're not really that important but they are when you think about it who really is leading this mass of people towards achieving one thing it's not only making money but it's how do we make that money right and so that's really their responsibility so in a way they really do have a large influence on the organization and its overall performance so the management team of any company is influential in running the business and maintaining a rela relationship with employees. So when a company chooses to acquire another company, respecting this fundamental belief, this value for management, is important to understanding management turmoil in M&A. So why is there so much turnover in the target company's management team after an acquisition? Is it good for the acquirer? Can you prevent it? And should you be preventing it? So these are the questions we'll answer. So first, let me display the research. So Jeffrey Krug, he really collected all of this data and there are previous studies that he referenced, but I'm gonna focus on his research. And he sliced this data up in many different ways, really delving deep into the analysis. So firms on average lose between eight to 10% of top executives each year through normal attrition, like retirement or departures. Now, following an acquisition, that average triples to around 24% in the first year and an additional 15% in the second year. So let's compare these two turnover rates. So in year one, on average, you get between 8 to 10%. So on average, for target company turnover rates, is about 9%. Whereas that average, when an acquired firm is, is followed, is 24%. So over a quarter or really a quarter of the management team leaves in the first year. Now in the second year, 42% of the management team has left. So in two years alone, four out of the 10 people, 10 of the most senior people in, in the acquired company are expected to leave on average. And so that's, that's a big drain from a talent perspective, especially if you're acquiring the management's competence. If that company is bad and just is underperforming, therefore you got to cut management anyways, then that's, that's good. But if you're acquiring the management team for their capabilities and, and really building that business to what it is there and today, then it's important to really recognize that there's a huge potential for them to leave very quickly out the door. Now, earlier research analyzed 147 publicly traded targets acquired between 1986 and 1988. And I'll say about this, like when I was reading this book, that was the kind of the fourth merger wave of really North America's 
business world, M and A world. Uh, that was dur during the LBO days, where there was just you know companies could really raise a lot of money. Uh, go go to Drexel and Michael Milken, and he'd give you billions of dollars, and you could bo go buy companies. And so you had a very aggressive entrepreneurs and investors. So I would take this research with a grain of salt, but several conclusions were made. One, M and A creates conditions that lead to abnormally high turnover rates in target the targets management team. Two, most of the significant turnover occurs in the first two years, on average around 40%, which is similar to what uh, Jeffrey Cruz's research confirms. Three, acquirers initiate major change in a single year, usually the first. And four, the effects of early turnover lingers for many years. And so that can be a psychological effect on the employees and the performance of the business. So this research kind of confirms the much later and more comprehensive research that Jeffrey offered in the book. Now, Mr. Krug took several steps forward in order to better understand this phenomenon. So he first considered different periods of time associated with different merger waves. And so I talked about how I would take this this time period with a grain of salt. So what he did is he split it up. So he compared non-merged -fir non firm firms performance versus firms that are acquired between 1980 and 1989, firms that were acquired between 1990 and 1999, and firms that were acquired in 2000 to 2004. Now, once again, I will make a note. You see, there's there's a lot, especially when it comes to research, you have to really be independent and in your thinking. But right away, I'd, I'd comment on, on that time period. I think that's too short. You know, he's comparing a, a nine-year period compared to a four-year period, especially when he's really excluding the peak years of 2006 and seven, where, you know, there was a massive private equity boom right before the financial collapse and money was free-flowing and I'm sure it, they were even more aggressive. But still, you can see a big difference in just the first year uh, turnover rate. So the lowest, of course, is non-merged firms, but among the three time periods, the 1990 to 1999 period had the lowest turnover rate at 21%, whereas the 2000 to 2004 period had a 36% turnover rate. So it seems that in modern in the modern era, people are more aggressive. So the data seems to suggest that acquirers have become more aggressive about integrating target companies and appear to be replace them more quickly than acquirers in the 1980s and 1990s. So by the second year, half of your management team on average is gone and they're replaced by the management team of the acquirer, right? People that support the acquirer's goals. But again, you know, for me, and, and I, I'll, I'll be repeating this a lot, I just, it doesn't make sense to me to acquire a company, a good business, and then fire the management team or push them out. Because the reason that good business became a good business is because of its leadership team. So if you see the leadership team leaving, then you're risking really the future performance of that business, right? So yes, they're more aggressive. And maybe this data, seeing that the sample size is only 44 companies relative to 356, maybe that sample size is skewed. But at the same time, if it is true, and in our modern era, uh, you know, the acquiring companies are much more aggressive in pushing out the target management team, that there can be a lot of risk with that strategy. Now, in addition, Jeffrey decided to then consider the pre-merger ownership structure of the target firm. Was it publicly traded, a private company, or a subsidiary of a selling firm? And so he once again compared uh, the public tar targets, the privately held targets, and the subsidiaries versus the non-merged firm performance. And so the non-merged firm performance is exactly the same in, in, in really all, all of the, the charts that I'm showing you. But what's different is that, again, Jeffrey Krug, kind of split it up in different ways and looked at it from a different perspective. Now, public targets seem to have the highest tar uh, turnover rate. So when the target company is publicly listed and much more out in the open, the management team is much more exposed. Whereas if it's a privately held target, the turnover rate is significantly lower. So it's 21% versus the 36% uh, turnover rate for public uh, targets. And so I think that's a big difference and important comment to make. Now, this is a relatively intuitive observation confirmed by the research provided in the last slide. Unlike publicly traded firms, 
Privately held companies cannot be acquired without their consent, the consent of the management team. Thus, executives are in a better position to negotiate favorable terms that guarantee their continued employment after the acquisition. With regards to divisional sales, which is the subsidiary sales, which is in the middle ground between 36 and 21 at 24 percent, it kind of follows in between those two lines. Uh, So... Uh, With regards to divisional sales, there is a lot of turnover originating from executives who were rotated into the subsidiary or division on short-term assignments. They usually return to the parent company. And so this is something that I picked up when I read the book. I never thought about it, but with a a, a subsidiary uh, sale, if you have a big conglomerate company or a very large multinational company and they sell a certain region of branches, well, there will be some executives who were sent on an assignment to those branches to oversee that, earn some respect, and then eventually return back to corporate headquarters and work their way up that corporate ladder. That's just a normal lateral move. But when that sales occur, you know they're not going to be making that switch in the middle of negotiations. So the sale will be completed and they'll leave the company and then come back to headquarters, the, the, their company, which they initially started with. And so I never really thought of that, but that also drives some of the turnover rate in a subsidiary sale. Now, Jeffrey also considered the breakdown from an industry perspective and found some interesting results. So he took, I believe, two, four, six, eight, nine, nine, nine industries. So the financial services like banks, telecom, oil and gas, consumer, retail, manufacturing, uh, emerged firms, uh, retail should be... Uh, oh, this is uh, more more of the production side. So there's a retail, uh, like the, um, the retail stores, and there's the retail production. Sorry, I forgot to put production there. And then non-merged firms. So when you look at year one, the turnover rates, I, I I'll make a comment. The highest is the consumer segment, so consumer cyclicals, consumer businesses, the, at a 29% rate. Also, the financial services sector is relatively high at 27. But over the years, the patterns change. And you'll see that even though the financial services turnover rate is relatively high or the second highest among the industries considered in the first year, it's actually the lowest by a very significant margin in the last year, in the year 10. So it seems that there's a lot of turnover early on, but then that turnover is not as high in the later years. Whereas you have the consumer segment or oil and gas and retail, where they start at a relatively low turnover, but across the years, their turnover rates are really high at 93% for both retail and oil and gas. So it's interesting to really kind of look at that and say, well, why is that the case? Why is it that with financial services, their turnover rates are much lower over the long term than oil and gas or retail? Well, over time, it seems that patterns change. Turnover in the financial industry is significantly lower than other industries over the long run, whereas in oil and gas and retail, 93% of the original management team are gone by the 10th year after the acquisition. And so that's an average. So just a little uh, higher, that means that essentially the entire management team is replaced by the end of the 10-year period. And on average, only one of the original management team, one of a hypothetical 10-person management team is still there. Now, one possible explanation for this rate of turnover in oil and retail seems to be the intensity of reporting that both industries receive. Everyone follows the price of oil and care a lot about retail much more than manufacturing or financial services firms. So really the thinking and Jeffrey Krug's thinking is that he says, okay, you know what? The reason why is they're always in the public spotlight and they're highly cyclical businesses, right? So when that cyclicality occurs, shareholders always demand change. And among the easiest changes, you know, CAPEX spending and the management team. They are very expendable because you say, oh, we'll bring in new leadership and change the strategy and everything will change. And majority of the time, fundamentally, nothing changes in the company, but it's just the appearance that the management team changes because of the rotation of personnel. Right, so that's kind of his thinking. And I kind of agree with that. I think that's the reason why the uh, in, in the oil and gas and retail more cyclical businesses, the turnover rates are higher versus the less cyclical businesses like financial services, which 
that includes insurance, that includes wealth management, investment banking, which is much more sli- cyclical. But wealth management, uh, mutual funds, all of those, those can be, those are not as cyclical from a fee perspective, from a revenue business perspective. We're not talking about the market. We're talking about the business itself and its profitability. Um, so yeah, so this is a, this was relatively interesting to me. That's essentially the research that he presented at the start of the book, and then he goes at into length that different uh, he talks about if uh, m a ad v- adds value how does it add value should companies be pursuing m a but really the most important thing that i think he touched upon was the relationship between executive turnover and post merger underperformance so jeffrey krug determines that based upon his research there seems to be no real impact by increased executive turnover on merger success It is the industry structure, culture of merging firms, application of technology, business fundamentals, and industry stage of development, among other factors, that alter desired performance. So when I first approached this book, my initial assumption of post-merger executive turnover was that the more executives leave the company, the more the company, uh, the target company underperforms and the acquisition is a failure. Now, my thinking was very one sided and very single minded in the sense that I was only focusing on one factor. There are numerous changes that need to be made in order for a merger to be successful rather than just leadership changes. So if you think of it just from a single factor perspective, it, it there's no real relationship. So he took took a look at all of this performance. He looked at the stock market performance of the uh, publicly traded acquiring company who acquired a target company and their post-merger success. And he saw that there was actually positive average performance following the merger of a mean meaningless three percent increase in the share price over the long term so there wasn't there's no real data to confirm a a significant and real relationship between executive turnover and post-merger performance if executive turnover increases well then yes in some cases the the company will underperform because it will lose key talent but at the the other side of the argument is if ex- executive turnover increases and the company w- was run poorly well then the, the 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 acquiring company can actually implement the proper management strategy in order to increase the performance of that target company so it, it's really difficult to say and it, it, with real it, it, it's really difficult to confirm looking at the data that executive turnover and post-merger performance are related. And so that's why Jeffrey Krug concluded that no, there seems to be no real impact. Now, in some instances, terminating management might actually help as long as the objectives of the strategic change are achieved. The focus should not be on keeping existing management, but reestablishing leadership stability by matching skills with different functions around the company. It is not the turnover, but rather the timing that is the problem. Research shows that terminating target executives immediately following an acquisition appears to have the most detrimental effect on performance. Now, I made a separate video on my channel with regards to the HR and morale issues of m and I, I, I really get fascinated. I am fascinated about the post-integration process of mergers and acquisitions, and so that's why I've been making all these videos. And so when I spent time on that video, one of my big takeaways was that research showed that it's better to apply big changes, big layoffs quicker, on, quicker in the process in order to not leave people up in the air and wondering, oh my gosh, am I going to lose my job? Make those changes right away. You know, Cut that limb as quickly as possible so it doesn't spread and disease the rest of the body. And so that was their approach. But it seems, and once again, this is what happens with academia and research, this is a contradicting view. So in this view, when it comes to the executive team, the timing, if you fire them right away, that can actually really scare the rest of the employees and, and create the uh, uh, underperformance issues. So in this sense, Jeffrey Krug confirms that based on his research, it is better to terminate executives if the acquirer wants to later on in the process rather than earlier on and spend time training the proper executives who understand the business to then rotate them into those roles once they are terminated later on. So don't rush and cut all all of those senior positions quickly. 
Now, let's talk about why do executives leave. So we can begin by understanding where management and their advisors focus before and after the merger. During the pre-merger period, strategic fit issues, the quantitative issues, prevail. Now during the post-merger period, organizational issues, the qualitative issues, prevail. So it is clear that when it comes to how deals are approached, the financials are prioritized over the soft issues of an M&A deal in, earlier on in the process, which creates problems which need to be dealt with later on in the process. So really, there's a, there's a balance from an advisory perspective when it comes to understanding both the quantitative and qualitative issues, and also integrating it, helping management understand the, in, the post-merger integration process in order for them not to make mistakes earlier on. But most people do. So let's look at those mistakes. So the way in which the target's top management team is managed after the acquisition is a critical part of the integration process. They play an important role helping the acquiring company integrate the culture systems and values of the two companies. In addition, they play an important role in communicating with employees and keeping employees informed about the objectives of the merger and how the merger will affect their future roles in the organization. Now, through the hundreds of interviews Mr. Krug has compiled, here are some of the common comments made by target company executives when they, once they shared their opinions with the professor. So one, the acquirer didn't understand our business. They, did, they had no interest in our local community. They didn't care about our employees. They didn't honor their promises and they were unethical or dishonest. They took my division away from me. And if I hadn't left, I would have been terminated. And so these are very common comments and it makes sense. Majority of the time, the acquiring firm adopts this when loose perspective where it's like we acquired you and therefore we are better than you and we we are bigger than you and therefore we we need to tell you what to do even though you run your business and you have built up your business of which we wanted to buy in the first place which just doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense to alienate alienate the people that actually built up the business that you wanted to pay for and you actually paid for right and so th these are some some common comments now he also found that about one third of the executives he spoke with were terminated, whereas another one third left to avoid termination before their job status was reduced or because they felt alienated by the executives of the acquiring firm. So not only are there the termination turnover rates, which is unavoidable because sometimes you will need to ter terminate some people, but at the same time, there were one third of the executives felt that they needed to leave because they felt that unwelcome feeling. They felt that they were going to get fired, even though they probably weren't going to get fired. So let's consider the five different factors that could influence their decision to leave. So there are the executive's characteristics, the, the personal characteristics, the characteristics of the merger, how the deal was structured and handled. There's the cross-border M&A issues. There's the target company characteristics, so how the target company is and acts around the, uh, the acquiring company, and how the industry characteristics influence the decisions of executives. So executive characteristics. The two big ones are age. Now, due to the uncertainty that arises as the organization undergoes this change, older, more risk-averse senior executives are more likely to depart. 40% of target company chairs, CEOs, and presidents depart within five years of the acquisition. And so these are much senior and older people compared to 20%, 27% of much younger vice presidents, controllers, and secretaries during that same period. So there's a higher turnover rate with older, more senior people versus more of the middle uh, class um corporate executives. So the vice presidents relative to the senior vice presidents and division heads are much more stable and they don't leave as quickly as their seniors. Now from a status and autonomy perspective, executives who have worked their entire co careers to acquire the seniority and autonomy that comes with an executive role are more likely to leave if they feel demoted and inferior in the post-merger firm. And this is probably the easiest and most logical example to provide when it comes to why executives leave. Executives leave because the acquiring firm has acquired the target firm and now they have a boss. Before they only respond 
responded to the board of directors, but now they have to respond to a divisional or subsidiary head of the acquiring firm. And that guy is not even on the pecking order. Not even He's not even uh, uh, below the CEO. He might be uh, a, a vice president within a certain division. And all of a sudden you have a CEO of a company who was respected, especially if he was a, it was, if it was a publicly traded company, who could do whatever he wanted. And now he's responding to this young MBA Ivy League graduate. He feels alienated. He feels pissed off that he doesn't have that autonomy anymore. And so that's the easiest example. But I did find the age example, the age side, the characteristic to be very helpful. So it seems that older people are much more likely to leave. And maybe that's just because they're stubborn and they just don't have the patience to deal with this bureaucracy, or maybe that they just are more risk averse. Now, merger characteristics. So feelings of status are developed early in the acquisition negotiation process. If negotiations are conducted in a professional atmosphere and feelings of equality are promoted, turnover is lower. However, when negotiations are less friendly, as in the case of a hostile bidder or tender offer, executive turnover tends to be higher as negative feelings tend to motivate executives to leave. So with regards to the negotiation process, the merger itself, if it's a friendly white knight deal, usually uh, executives feel much more protected and welcomed and therefore turnover is lower. However, especially with hostile bidders, especially in the 1980s, when you had those corporate raiders, executives were felt very, very threatened. And there's an entire business focused on protecting those executives. You know, they even hired private investigators to make sure that they weren't being followed by other private investigators. It was it was a crazy era on Wall Street. But now when it comes to executive safety executives need to feel like they, they they are cared for and treated well you know at the same time they work for the company but they've devoted their life to the company and they demand respect and if they don't earn that respect or have that respect from the hostile bidder or if the acquiring firm goes directly to the shareholders through a tender offer that could alienate the executive now note results are not significant enough to confirm these broad statements so I, I, I wanted to include that there because when I was looking at his research and I was looking at the numbers, I'm like, yeah, that's true, but like it's not true for every single case. It's not true that if it's a hostile bid or if it's a tender offer, all tender offer uh, acquisitions will have higher ter- executive ton- turnover. That's not true, but it's more likely that turnover will be higher in those situations because of that feeling of status and that, that that promotion of equality. Now, characteristic number three is cross-border M&A. The primary difference between foreign and domestic M&A is the timing of turnover. In domestic acquisitions, turnover occurs more quickly within the first two years, whereas the full effects of cross-border mergers are felt five to six years after the acquisition. In a cross-border acquisition, foreign acquirers are faced with integrating a target company that is not physically, not only physically more distant, but is also culturally different. They move more slowly and leverage the target's management team and their local knowledge and relationships. So interestingly, target company executives tend to depart more quickly when the acquiring firm has already made acquisitions in their country. Acquiring firms accumulate integration experience through past acquisitions, and this experience gives them more confidence in subsequent acquisitions. As it makes more uh, local acquisitions in the country, the acquirer becomes less dependent on the target's local knowledge. And so with regard to this, this is very simple. It, It makes sense. At the end of the day, if the acquirer has no experience in acquiring a foreign business. The turnover of the of the, ma- the management team is very low. Usually they keep that management team for a while as they learn about the business, as they learn about the country, and eventually transition in their own individuals and rotate in their own people. But if they already have experience in that market, they don't, they don't really need to be accustomed to it because they already are. They understand it. And so turnover is much quicker when the acquiring company already has experience in that market. Now, number four is firm characteristics. One factor that appears to decrease target executive retention is large size differences between merging firms. 
when the acquirer is larger in size relative to the acquired firm, it is more likely that the acquirer has a supply of skilled executives who can be transferred into the acquired firm. Moreover, executives in small target companies may be less able to manage uh, executive positions in large, larger, more bureaucratic acquiring firms. Psychological barriers may also lead to greater greater turnover. And so this is also very easy to understand. Essentially, if there's a big, big difference in the size of the companies from a market cap perspective, well, the cultures of those companies will differ greatly. The way decisions are made, the amount of people involved in those decisions differ. And so uh, if you have a small target company where really their vice presidents and division heads really didn't need to sit around in boardrooms and talk about decisions and could just act quickly, then it's a big system shock when they get thrown into these boardrooms and have to respond to many, many people and explain their thinking before they actually act. So there's that big, big change in their day-to-day lives and therefore turnover is much higher when there is that big size difference. Now, target firm performance obviously plays an important role in executive turnover. When the firm performs well relative to competitors, executives are viewed as competent and usually kept uh, kept on. When the firm performs poorly, executives are viewed as less competent. However, acquiring firms usually don't buy underperforming firms. Rather, the majority of acquisitions are driven by the desire of acquiring firms to buy good performers, companies with assets, skills, and executive competencies. And I already talked about this. Well, the problem is, if you are buying good companies, then why is executive turnover still on average so high? If most acquiring firms buy good companies why is executive turnover high so it, it, you know that was when i was reading that statement and i was reading that run respective chapter that was my thing i was just like what but that doesn't make sense okay yeah so the target firm performance is very important and if the company is performing very well then executives are viewed as competent well if they're viewed as competent then why do they still get pushed out or feel alienated then it just really shows how how ignorant the acquiring firm can be how ignorant they are on just the numbers and ignoring, uh, ignoring you know the human side, the soft issues of M and A, and that com- returns back to my other HR video on M and A because in that video I really talk about how a lot of firms do forget that, right? So it seems to me that most times that turnover is due to the acquiring firm rather than just the target firm and external issues. And the final reason or the final category is industry characteristics. So as the relatedness of the two merging firms increases, the asset and cost redundancies also increase, giving way to synergistic benefits. So this is like a horizontal merger. Now, most people would assume that as industry relatedness increases, executive turnover also increases. Research, however, concludes that there is no meaningful relationship between the two. Some findings actually conclude that turnover was higher in the first month for unrelated acquisitions. So it seems that whether it's a horizontal or vertical merger, it does not matter. At the end of the day, executive turnover is the same in both situations. And I think that's very important to remember. Now, Mr. Krug actually considered a different analysis looking at it from an industry perspective. He considered local industries, which are ones that are difficult to consolidate globally, versus global industries, which are much easier to consolidate internationally. And so he provided some examples. So some examples of local industries would be dairy products, machinery, food products, plumbing. These are things that you can't have a central hub for these things internationally. Those are local industries that need to be operated locally. Now, for global industries, is communications equipment, computers, engines, uh, industrial chemicals. Those things can be produced outside of the country can be produced internationally you know they don't have uh, there's no risk of them going bad or anything you just have to ship them into the country and you have that ability whereas you can't milk a cow in canada and ship it to africa you need to milk a cow in africa and sell it in africa right so that's really the difference between local industries and global industries in his eyes now his research found that executives in target companies that complete compete in global industries tend to depart more quickly than executives in target companies that compete in local industries. 
So the thinking behind that is essentially with global industries, the ability to integrate those subsidiaries is much easier and much quicker. And therefore, that turnover is quicker. Whereas with local industries, the acquiring firm still needs to operate those operations in that country. They can't really move a lot of those operations away. Therefore, they are much more dependent on the existing management team of that target company. Okay. So therefore, the effects of competing in a global industry are immediate and long term. In global industries, local knowledge is less critical to a firm's success, and therefore, executive turnover is higher. Now, what is the strategy to manage target company executives after acquisitions? So data confirms that executives with the best performance histories are the ones who depart the earliest, making their decisions even before the acquisition closes. So it's important to make sure that if you want to keep the best talent, that talent's going to walk right out the door because everyone's going to give them a job. Everyone's really interested in hiring them. So you need to make sure that you're going to keep them. So the three steps are to identify poor performers, make sure that you're not really defining imagination team as good or bad, but rather looking at the individual managers and the vice presidents and the CEOs and the CFO and, ev and everyone else on that executive team and understand who's good and who's bad. Then keep the good performers and assign those, those performers with the best skills to each of the divisions that would work for them and fulfill their needs. And then, of course, minimize the effects of unavo unavoidable turnover. Sometimes there are external issues that you just can't avoid. Uh, I was reading the book and there were some, there were some uh, executives who really just cited family reasons. My family decided that now is the time for me to walk away, now is the time for me to go into teaching or something else. So there are a lot of unavoidable issues and you need to minimize the effects. At the end of the day, you, ha you as the acquiring firm need to focus on leadership stability, not avoiding, just n not preventing everyone from leaving you really need to just focus on trying to keep the best people and at the same time making sure that leadership is stable in order for the people on the ground level, the people who are actually running the business, to not feel threatened, to feel cared about and respected. Because at, at the end of the day, they are the ones who are going to be influencing the performance of the firm on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, there are some final comments. So when considering the organizational fit of an M&A deal, analyzing the skills of a target and acquire management teams is important. So if top management has similar skills, and this is this is something that I really learned at the end at the end of this book. If top management have similar skills, then there's then there's a lot of redundancies. If you have a vice president who understands the a market in X Y Z, and you just acquired a company who has a similar vice president who understands the market in X Y Z, then you probably don't need that vice president. However, if you have a vice president who ex understands A B C market and you just acquired a, pre a vice president that understands the XYZ market, then that works. And so it, they complement each other. So you need to focus on keeping management, the management team of the target company that complements your existing management team. If there are similar skills and they are very similar, they might get along better. And that's why this is a big problem. They might get along better because they l uh, appear to be similar, but they're redundant. And so you should be cutting those people rather than the people that are actually different, the people that can really offer a differing perspective, which helps you run that business the way it is already run. Now, second comment, executive tenure. Research shows that retaining target company executives with longer organizational tenures leads to more successful acquisitions. As an executive's tenure with his or her firm increases, they develop a non-transferable knowledge of the firm's history and culture, key drivers of long-term success. In addition, they develop a relationships with suppliers, buyers, and competitors that lead to more effective strategy execution. So not only do you need to be focusing on management uh, uh, managers that complement your existing management team, but those that have a long tenure, not the people that had just come two years ago from, a, 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 again, an uh, Ivy League school with an MBA. Those are not the people that you should be keeping. You should be keeping the ones who really started at the ground level and work the way up and understand the business fully. Those are the most valuable executives to make sure that you keep and target. 
Now, training future executives. When executives are transferred into a new position, especially when they are transferred to a different division, it is natural that they will take actions that highlight their managerial capabilities and improve their future opportunities for a promotion. Management rotations can thus be a useful tool. However, it can also create an atmosphere of continuous change that exacerbates anxieties and uncertainties among target company employees. So when the acquiring firm is trying to integrate their people into the uh, target firm, they need to do it in a way in which it's fair. It's a two-way street. Maybe take some target company employees and put them into the acquiring firm. Show that you're not trying to really push onto their turf and take over their business and push them out. You want to show that, look, we're trying to achieve the same goal. We're trying to run this business the way you've been running it already. You've been running it at a top quality notch. Okay, great. Let's continue to run this. Let's put some of our employees to learn from you. Let's give some, uh, let's take some of your employees so that we can teach them about our business as well. And so that really does support, again, just the overall positive relationship between a target company and the acquired firm. Other than that, that's pretty much it for this video. If you have any questions or concerns, please do comment below and I'll be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. And if you like this video, it, it was a relatively long video, but I really, really enjoyed reading this book. So if you like this video, please like and subscribe to the channel for more videos and I will be very, very thankful. Have a great day, guys. Thank you.